Mamie, thank you for joining thank us. You. Thank you, Mr. Fellows. During World War II, my husband, Dwight D. Eisenhower, wrote 319 letters to me. His letters were personal and loving and revealed a side to him unknown to the public. Ike would talk of everyday life on the battlefront, but sometimes he would wrestle with problems. Of course, Ike's letters were subject to censorship, and often I would hear military and battle news from the newspapers long before he would mention it. The beauty of his letters was his personality, his hopes and fears, coming through the pages all the years we were separated. And I heard his inner thoughts, worries, and philosophical ponderings. He tried to hide the exhaustion, frustrations, and doubts that he felt every day during the war. He was lonely and desperately wanted the war to be over. He resented the loss of life and despised the Nazi beast. In public, he was confident, smiling, comfortable, and stable. But in his letters, I saw him exhausted from a grueling life of worry, mild flu-like symptoms for years, too much smoking, and hectic travel to meet with dignitaries and troops. He was confident in public but humble in private. From 1942 to 1943, he was promoted twice and finally accepted himself as a top war leader. With his appointment as Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces, he was finally self-assured. He was isolated in the war zones, so I would tell him what I heard in the newspapers and radio programs but he had no idea of the outpouring of support he had with the American public. He did not look forward to fame and glory when he got home, but wanted a post-war life together of traveling, fishing, hunting, and writing. I was never able to join him in Europe, but we had a brief two-day visit in Washington in December 1943. <clears throat> we were separated for two and a half years. Our loving relationship was not smooth, however. He was often exasperated with me and scolded me, but I was lonely too. We were far apart, there were rumors of his affair and my drinking, and I had several health issues. We had some friction on his brief trip home, and I regretted that we had changed but it was hardly surprising given the, given the length of our separation. In spite of the rumors, none of it was true, and our love, though shaken at times, never ended. I treasure each letter that Ike sent me. I am proud to share his thoughts and feelings to me, since I want people to know Ike as the upstanding, thoughtful, and loving man that he was. These private letters, <clears throat> excuse me, these private letters are housed in the Eisenhower Library in Abilene, Kansas, and you are free to read them for yourselves. You will hear his voice and feelings about his important job during World War II. Commander in Chief, U.S. Forces Europe, June 23rd to August 1st, 1942. Events on the front. On Sunday morning, June 21, 1942, Dwight and Major General Mark Clark met at the White House with Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill to discuss an ultimate Allied victory. <clears throat> Ike had been chief planner for Army Chief of Staff G General George C. Marshall, but now he had command of a theater of war. He left my son John and me at Fort Myer and flew to London. He was in charge of Operation Torch, an invasion of North Africa, and was designated Allied Commander. He was working around the clock and wrote very few letters home. Here are some of his letters. I cannot tell you how much I miss you. An assignment like this is not the same as an absence from home on maneuvers. 
in a tent surrounded by soldiers, it seems natural to have to get along alone. But when living in an apartment, I constantly find myself wondering, why isn't Mamie here? You're certainly, you've certainly become most necessary to me. There is a lot to do here. Sometimes there seems so much to do, I can scarcely believe we can do it in time. But we've got to put it over. So we tear into the thing and never allow ourselves to think of failure. Telegram on our anniversary, July 1st, 1942. Because of you, I've been the luckiest man in the world for 26 years. Love, Ike. I brought your picture to the office. It sits on a mantle right in front of my eyes, and it helps. It is not possible to give you a real idea of my daily life. It is a hard grind, but only times I really get worn down are when, in spite of hard work, no progress is immediately noticeable, but we are going ahead. Planning for North Africa, August 2nd to October 31st, 1942. Events on the front. Torch, the invasion of North Africa, was the first Allied attempt at a major amphibious landing. Ike's modest rank, Lieutenant General, placed him at a disadvantage when dealing with his superiors, especially Churchill. He had to command British officers with considerable combat experience, just the area in which he was deficient. On August 7th, President Roosevelt notified Churchill that Ike was definitely to command Torch. Ike needed to identify landing sites in Morocco and Algeria, but American and British military chiefs disagreed about landing sites. In September, the two heads of government agreed to land at Casablanca, Oran, and Algiers. The invasion depended on the cooperation of the French as well. The final date for Torch would be November 8th. Ike himself had made the final decision. With the day of departure for Gibraltar drawing near, fear of possible failure crept into Ike's mind. Yet his letters were always about his love for me and never about his fears and worries. Ike's letters. London. I have to sit and figure day in and day out how to get things done on time in a dozen different directions. How I wish you were living here. You cannot imagine how much you added to my efficiency in the hard months in Washington. I can't write to you the particular things you'd like me to tell you about, but I hope you'll read between the lines and realize how much you mean to me. Ever since General Marshall's visit, we've been keyed up to a higher pitch than ever. Naturally, I never talk business in my letters to you. Now, with everything so secret, I take my pen in hand with a feeling of, what can I say except to tell her I'm well and just as much in love with her as ever. Even the state of the weather is a secret, and very correctly so. The other day, an officer's wife showed up here as a Red Cross executive. First time I ever wished you were one of those club women. <laughs> then you might be ordered here. I write to no one but you with a pen. He hated to write. So he dictated all of his letters, but I insisted that I, I wanted handwritten letters so he would handwrite his letters to me. This morning I received a radio from General Marshall saying, Mrs. Eisenhower says she and the family are fine. Red Cross, Lease Land, OSS, AAA, BBB, CCC, and all the other organizations and letters get me nuts at times. Soldiering is no longer a simple thing of shouting, turn boys, turn. In, in a place like this, the commanding general must be a bit of a diplomat, a lawyer, a promoter, a salesman, a social hound, a liar, at least to get out of social affairs, a mountebank, an actor, Simon Legree, a humanitarian, 
an orator, and incidentally, sometimes I think most damnably, incidentally, a soldier. It's always a bright spot when a letter arrives. If it were not for the censors, I'd call you frequently on the phone. But they have to be so careful that a phone call is most unsatisfactory, so I'm told. When the day comes that this, all of this business is over and I come back to the U.S. at peace, maybe we'll raise potatoes on which to live. With a few pigs and chickens, we can be as happy as a pair of Georgia crackers with a good still. <laughs> I'm so d mad today that I shouldn't write to you. Every once in a while, my bad disposition gets the best of my good nature. He never did explain what, what he was angry about that time. Just as World War I brought in an era of almost hysterical change and restlessness, so will this one bring about revolutions in our customs, laws, and economic pro processes. Special economic, industrial, or social groups will apply pressures that will either be disruptive or might force the adoption of some form of dictatorship in our democracies. Either outcome would be tragic. The longer the war lasts, the greater will be the post-war problems. I don't mean to get either philosophical or morbid, but we've got a job to do. As men and women of character and of faith, in the soundness of democratic methods, we must work like dogs to justify that faith and make it the golden age of democracy. The Kansas City Star Man asked for a message for Kansas. I said I'd like to stand on an Abilene Street corner and say hello to the whole D town because they were all my friends. Know that you're the only person I'm in love with. I've, like some, been somewhat intrigued by others, but haven't been in love with anyone else and don't want any other wife. <clears throat> if disaster strikes close to a man, he must take it. But I feel that if anything should ever happen to me, the one big thing you'd want to know is that I tried to do my duty like a man and to the best of my ability. This I'll always strive to do, so you and John will never have to feel anything but pride in my military service. Successful landings in Africa, frustration in Tunisia, November 1st to December 31st, 1942. Events on the front. Foul weather occurred when Ike left England for Gibraltar, and he ordered the flight of six B-17 flying fortresses to fly at night. Miraculously, they all got through. On November 8th, they were there were encouraging reports of the landings in Algiers and Casablanca. <laughs> Admiral Darlin of the Vichy Army ordered the French forces to cease fire. There was widespread criticism of the Darlin deal in the United States and Great Britain. Ike smoothed the decision and Churchill reluctantly accepted it. Ike's personal responsibility of the deal increased his stature with the leaders. The first British army began the push to Tunisia. Nazi troops from Italy and Sicily poured into Tunisia on the airstrips. The failure of the Tunisian attack was worrisome, but the Allies established a firm foothold in Africa, the prelude to final victory in the Mediterranean. Letters from Ike, Gibraltar. I am in the Mediterranean area. Maybe I can do something here that will hurt the Axis, and that's what I live to do. Almost everything is on the censored list and makes letter writing a terrible chore. I know it's hard to believe, but our sole re reaction or diversion from constant problems is the letters we get. I never get to read the stories in the newspapers. 
You must understand that a newspaper man always has to draw on his imagination freely in order to give his stories color. Whatever they print, much of it is just exaggeration. My health remains good, considering the flu I had and the hours I keep and the life I lead, also the number of cigarettes I burn up. This job gets backbreaking at times. Still, I wouldn't miss my chance to lick the hun to the very limit of my capabilities. My one passion is to see him beaten to his knees. As pressure mounts and strain increases, everyone begins to show the weakness in his makeup. It is up to the commander to conceal his. Above all, to conceal doubt, fear, and distrust, and try to overcome the defects he finds around him. I love you. Never forget that. Because except for my duty, which I try to perform credibly, the only thing to which I can cling, it is the only thing to which I can cling with confidence. Casablanca and Eisenhower's future role January 1st to February 7th, 1943. Events on the front. Ike was concerned about the conference to be held near Casablanca between the president, the prime minister, and their military chiefs. He flew from Algiers to Casablanca. Over the Atlas Mountains, his worn out B-17 lost two engines. When they landed, Ike appeared jittery. Ike retained top command in Tunisia, General Harold Alexander's forces in the east and Ike's in the west were still operating on a cooperative rather than a unified basis. Ike had walking pneumonia and was driving himself <coughs> beyond his physical limits, but found it impossible to delegate as much as he would have liked. Um, Ike's letters. You are the one person in this world that will listen to me without criticism and with full understanding. The few Americans and British ladies here, Red Cross, WAX, nurses, employees, and etc., are all quite nice. I suppose there are 75 to 100 in the city with 1,000 to 2,000 British and American officers, and God knows how many enlisted men. There's nothing new for me to say unless I can think of an original way of saying, you're quite a gal. I never doubt for one instant that we're going to beat this enemy, and I won't let anyone else doubt either. Set back at Kasserin Pass, February 8th through 28th, 1943. Events on the front. Ike was worried about the situation in the Tunisian front. <clears throat> Excuse me. That 250-mile stretch was painfully weak. The British in the north had a strong position, but the French in the middle, still demoralized from their defeat in 1940 and poorly equipped, were constantly in trouble. They lost 2,500 men in three weeks. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel's forces, pursued by Montgomery's British Eighth Army, had retreated into Tunisia. Ike issued, ordered the first U.S. Armored Division to a central position, but his directive was not adequately carried out. Rommel's forces hit the American lines and the American positions crumbled. Within a few days, Rommel's offensive was reaching its high point, but Ike was confident that Rommel could eventually be contained. The Battle of Kasserin gave Ike confidence that Rommel's forces were now nearly depleted. It also gave him a heightened feeling of affiliation with the frontline soldier, hence his philosophy, nobody who is not in a foxhole has a right to complain. Some of his letters. Distances are so great and time always so pressing that it takes a lot of figuring to cover any real extent of territory. 
On February 10th, Ike was promoted to four-star general. It meant a lot to him, but he put it in perspective when he told our son John, you are the only one who had the sense to see that it doesn't amount to a tinker's dam in the winning of this war, and that is all that concerns me. Most jobs in the world, including the Army, have a higher authority to whom he, to whom we, and many times should, be referred. But only one man in his own heart and mind can decide, do we or do we not? The stakes are always highest, and the penalties are a loss of life. No man can always be right. So the struggle is to do one's best. Never be swayed by unworthy motives, but to do one's duty. Such things as popularity, favorable press, possible promotion, etc., must be completely disregarded. I am simply trying to say that in a job like this, so many things are so big that even a fourth star fails to cause any great internal excitement. I want to always do my duty to the extreme limit of my ability. Finally, we'll win, but we can't afford bad mistakes or any complacency. We must think clearly, strike rapidly, and never give up. Both my temper and my disposition are sometimes sorely tried, but I think I do a pretty good job of controlling both. Um, you must realize that in such a confused life as we lead here, all sorts of stories, gossip, lies, etc., can get started without the slightest foundation in fact. So I want you to know you can smile at anything. I'm trying to do my duty every day, and my only hope is that this war will be over quickly. Victory in Tunisia, March 1st to May 13th, 1943. On the front, Rommel withdrew from Kasserine Pass. Ike was now a four-star general in complete charge of his theater and the certainty of ultimate success of the North African campaign represented a real milestone. Gener Major General Omar Bradley assumed command of the U.S. Second Corps from General George Patton, who was planning for Sicily. American victories in Tunisia provided a great boost to morale on the home front. Letters from Ike. I've had many trying situations with inadequate help, but now things are going fairly well. God, how I wish I could help make all Americans feel the deadly seriousness of this ta task. My old London driver, Kay Summersby, came down to serve in this theater. She is to be married to a young American colonel here. No matter what Life magazine says, I tell you only so if anyone is banal and foolish enough to lift an eyebrow at an old duffer such as I am in connection with the wax, Red Cross workers, nurses and drivers, you will know I've no emotional involvement and will have none. Um, I've seen too many mangled bodies to be much concerned with lesser sacrifices than those demanding life itself. And when I get to feeling sorry for myself, I try to remember that. I've aged at least five years since I left London. I've never written a personal letter that could possibly violate sane censorship. Actually, I lean over backwards to avoid violations in that regard. The D fool censor should know that if I so choose, I could send all my letters to the War Department for transmission because I, not the censors, carry the responsibility for the safety of this command. Today I write to you with a lighter heart than I have in many a moon 
As the papers tell you, we have just about completed this current job. The Conquest of Sicily, May 14th to September 2nd, 1943. Um, the British leaders wanted the invasion of Sicily, Operation Husky, um, and then to the boot of Italy, while Americans wanted Sardinia, Sardinia, closer to southern France and northern Italy. The British felt strongly about knocking Italy out of the war before the invasion of France. Ike promised to make recommendations when the victory in Sicily seemed near, and they proceeded to Malta and invaded Sicily. It was the first amphibious landing where the Allies would be opposed to Axis troops. As always, the weather was a problem. The landings were successful, and two days later, Ike went to Sicily. Ike's new status and mine was beginning to affect me personally. I did not have a secretary, and I was being plagued to make appearances and answer voluminous mail. Letters from Ike. The King of England conferred on me the Grand Cross of the Most Honorable Order of the Bath. This is the highest military award the British can give, and I must say, I feel very humble. Actually, of course, a success like the Tunisian climax results from the cooperative action of a lot of men, but the Allied Commander-in-Chief symbolizes Allied unity. Don't forget, I love only you, with all that's left in a 52-year-old bald-headed soldier. Sometimes I feel like I'm 92. <laughs> I had two letters from you. In one of them, you mentioned my driver, Kay Summersby, and a story you'd heard about the former marital, marital difficulties of her fiancé. Your letter gave me the first intimation that there was any story whatsoever. I just received a report that he was killed by a mine. I knew him quite well and I liked him. Here, death is an everyday occurrence, but the fundamentals are the same. Decency, generosity, cooperation, assistance in trouble, devotion to duty. These are the things that are of greater value than surface appearances and customs. Long before you receive this, you'll know whether or not our present venture is a success, and you will have been spared the agony of waiting to find out. The plan went off satisfactorily. Morale is always high in a unit that is in contact with the enemy, fighting him every day. I asked all the WAC officers and the men to see a movie at our house. The movie was fairly funny, Bob Hope. By the way, he came to see me the other day. He's done a grand job here entertaining soldiers. I believe he has been the favorite of the soldiers. Um, Ike also told me that, um, that um, Bing Crosby had a radio show during that time, and he mentioned on the um, show that Ike liked hominy grits. Well, he was bombarded with boxes and boxes of hominy grits <laughs> that kept coming across, and he got to the point where he just said, if I never see another box of hominy grits, he goes, I don't really even like them that much. But anyway, he told Mamie, you know, all about the hominy grits from Bing Crosby. Italy, September 3rd to November 4th, 1943. Events on the front. Um, the 8th Army secured the Allied bridgehead on the continent of Europe. The Italian armistice provided the formal surrender of the Italian armed forces, and it was made public on September 8th. Immediately, the German forces in Italy occupied the bulk of the peninsula. Italy would surrender. 
The following day, General Mark Clark's US, U.S. Fifth Army landed at Salerno, south of Naples. During October, Ike made four trips to the Italian front, where by se September 25th, Clark's Fifth Army and Montgomery's Eighth Army had formed a continual battle line across the boot of Italy. By October 23rd, Naples had fallen to the Allies. And as um, Mr. Fellows told you, you'll learn more about that at the next um, Coffee and Conversation when, when that gentleman talks about Anzio, because this is exactly where it happened and how it happened. Letters from Ike. Tunisia. You know, of course, that we are in the midst of a hard battle. There is no lull. There are no such things in war. That is, not if one is going as hard as he can after the enemy. It has now been 15 months since I saw you. My life is a mixture of politics and war. Our soldiers are wonderful. It always seems to me that the closer to the front, the better the morale and the less the grumbling. No one knows how I like to roam around among them. I'm always cheered up by a day with the actual fighters. <clears throat> Command decision November 5th to December 26th, 1943. On the front. During the fall of 1943, there were rumors of the command for the Allied invasion of France. Overlord. Churchill volunteered that Overlaw should, Overlord should be commanded by an American since the United States would eventually supply the vast bulk of the forces. Everyone assumed that General Marshall would be named. Ike supported the appointment of Marshall, but did not hide his own distaste for returning to Washington as Army Chief of Staff. He was willing to take a lesser position so that he could remain in the war zone. By December 5th, 1943, Roosevelt had definitely decided to give Ike the overlord command because Marshall was considered indispensable in Washington. Ike told the president, I realize such an appointment involved difficult decisions. I hope you will not be disappointed. On Christmas, he heard the announcement of his appointment as Supreme Commander. His letter to me was a masterpiece of understatement. He referred to his new assignment as an administrative problem. In his photographs, he looked like the cat that ate the canary. <laughs> Letters from Ike. I see all kinds of rumors in the newspaper alleging a reorganization of the Army High Command, but General Marshall is the greatest soldier in the world today. I know I'm a changed person. No one could be through what I've seen and not be different from what he was at the beginning. But in at least one way, I'm certain of my reactions. I love you. I wish I could see you an hour to tell you how much. I've been to Cairo, Jerusalem, Tunis, Italy, Sicily, Oran, etc. My latest trip to Italy was completed last night. It lasted a week. I think I've had a good case of homesickness lately. I try to hang on to some shreds of a good disposition, but it does get tough at times. Planning Overlord, January 20th to May 23rd, 1944. Events on the front. Ike flew to Washington for top-level conferences about Overlord, the landings in France. He visited his mother and our son John, and Ike and I went to White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, for a few days. It was the first time we had been together in 18 months. He returned to London with confidence and enthusiasm. Ike had changed in some ways. He was more self-assured. By the middle of May 1944, all basic planning for Overlord was completed. Letters from Ike. 
London. I find myself very glad I came home, even though things did seem a bit upsetting. I guess it was just because we'd been separated so long, and before we could really get acquainted again, I was on my way. Please don't grow impatient when you don't get letters. I won't have much opportunity to write, but I will be thinking of you. I miss you terribly. Sometimes I almost wish you were one of those executive types and had a Red Cross job here. But then you'd be different from what you are, wouldn't you? I wouldn't like that. I desperately miss you. When, why we have to have wars to separate families and cause all the anguish they do is sometimes impossible for me to understand. I think that all these trials and tribulations must come upon the world because of some great wickedness. Yet one would feel that man's mere intelligence, to say nothing of his spiritual perceptions, would find some way of eliminating war. <clears throat> No wartime soldier can retain his military effectiveness if he becomes tied up in the public mind with politics. You've won the admiration and respect of a lot of people that scarcely know you, but they do know some of the pitfalls you have so successfully dodged. And um, this was in reference to, I was complaining because I was getting so many letters so many requests for pictures, so many requests for Ike to um, bring their sons home, their brothers, their husbands home. Um, a lot of correspondence was coming through me in Washington, um, and I had no secretary, I had no, um, no one to help me with all of that. And it was, and besides, you know, I was lonesome and, and lonely too. Um, so I did tend to complain a lot in my letters to Ike about how busy I was and how overwhelming it was. And here he was. He had his own job to do. You finished your letter with a, this is Ike, Ike's letter. You finished your letter with a dark comment. Such tales as I've heard since returning to Washington. I know that people at home always think of the Army in the field as living a life of nightclubs, gaiety, and loose morals. 99% of officers and men are too busy to have any time for anything else. The principal concern is work. I'm living only to come back when this terrible thing is over. Last days in London, May 24th to June 3rd, 1944. This is the... Um, these are the few days right before the D-Day invasion. Um, the weather was such a problem that um, the invasion had been planned for Ju June 5th, but the weather was so bad that the um, leaders decided to put it off for one day. But the ultimate, the ultimate decision was on Ike, and he finally just said, let's go ahead. So, so um, that's why they landed on June 6th, in horrible weather. Letters from Ike, London. I have an uneasy feeling that there is almost nothing I can say in a letter. I seem to live on a network of high-tension wires. I get so de-homesick at times. Landings in France. June 6th through July 24th, 1944. Events on the front. Ike's aversion to self-dramatization was sincere. It was also a valuable asset for an Allied commander. He expressed himself in an exasperatingly low-key manner, deferring to D -Day, referring to D-Day in a telegram home as previous plans. Based on grim weather predictions, he reluctantly decided to postpone the invasion for 24 hours. He spent the day in agonizing suspense, but decided the invasion could wait no longer. I guess we better go, he said, thereby launching 
the greatest amphibian, amphibious armada of history on June 6. On Invasion Eve, Ike went to visit the U.S. 101st Airborne Division. The landings were successful and the casualties in the airborne drop were light. On June 7, Ike personally toured the Normandy beach landings. He was satisfied with the progress of the Normandy battle, but restless. He enjoyed seeing the troops, and they enjoyed seeing him. When the soldiers would see him, some would grin. Sentries would salute. Some would lean out of their trucks and yell, Hi, Ike! Ike would wave and yell back at them with a broad grin. On June 19, 1944, this is two weeks later, the worst storm in 50 years burst over the English Channel, halting supply of the invasion forces and wrecking the beachhead. This was the postponement date if Ike hadn't gone ahead on June 6. The first three weeks of July were a time of frustration as all efforts to break out of the bridgehead were, were producing only minimum gains. Ike was like a blind dog in a meat house, he said, with frustration. Letters from Ike. It's been 12, well, I'll read this one. We've started. Only time will tell how great our success will be. But all that can be done by human effort, intense devotion to duty, and courageous execution all by thousands and thousands of individuals will be done by this force. The soldiers, sailors, and airmen are indescribable in their elan, courage, determination, and fortitude. They inspire me. It's been 12 days since we started into France. Seems like that many years. How glad I'll be when finally it's all over and I can come home for good. Seems as if this war has been going on forever. I can't remember the time when we've had a normal life. One simply doesn't dare think about the sacrifices and losses. From Solo to the borders of Germany, <coughs> July 25th to September 11th, 1944. Events on the front. The extraordinary successes the Allies were now enjoying kept Ike occupied around the clock. With the front widening and deepening, large decisions had to be made quickly and by Ike himself. He changed the original plan for the invasion by sending Patton's Third Army eastward into the heart of France. Hitler threatened Patton's rear with a major attack by the 5th Panzer Army. Ike poured all available troops to Patton. He and Churchill planned Operation Dragoon, an amphibious assault in southern France. In two weeks, the French and Americans entered Paris. Americans entered Brussels, and Americans crossed the German border. French troops joined Ike's troops in Dijon. In spite of the growing euphoria on the home front, Ike knew the war was not entering its final phase. They were stretched beyond the limits of supply. He reminded me not to be too hopeful regarding an early end to the war. Letters from Ike. I realize that I'm not writing with my usual frequency, I just get hung up in places where it seems almost impossible to write a letter. I do hope that someday I get to go fishing with Axel. And Axel is Axel Nielsen, who was one of the original developers of Broomfield. Um, and he and Ike were, were great fishing buddies and friends. Right now, the morale on our front is exceedingly high. In war, there is no substitute for victory. I'll be glad when we get the final one, and I can come home to you. Tough weeks of autumn fighting, September 12th through December 15th, 1944. Events on the front. 
<coughs> excuse me, General Marshall and President Roosevelt chose not to interfere with Ike's conduct of the war. The 6th um, SS Panzer Army was creeping into position and Hitler launched a surprise attack known as the Bulge. Letters from Ike from Granville, France. You have seen in the papers that two days ago we launched a big airborne attack. There is still a lot of suffering to go through. God, I hate the Germans. Some, so many people are certain we've won the European war that frequently I'm asked what I intend to do after the war. In the first place, the question usually makes me angry because you can be certain this war is not won for the man that is shivering, suffering and dying up on the Siegfried line. The whole time and thought is tied up in winning this bloody mess. Of course we've changed in the last two years. The rule of nature is constant change, but it seems to me the thing to do is to retain our sense of humor and try to make an interesting game of getting acquainted again. After all, there is no problem separating us. It is merely distance, and that can someday be elim eliminated. Anyone in this war who has the slightest temptation to bemoan his lot or feel sorry for himself should visit the frontline soldier. Duty and loyalty and unity, all absolutely essential now to our future as a nation demand that all soldiers tend to their own jobs exclusively. Christmas of the Bulge, December 16th, 1945 to January 24th, 1945. 1944 ended with the biggest bang. Hitler's great offensive jumped off in frightening strength. The 5th Panzer Army reduced the American strongholds and surrounded the U.S. United States 101st Airborne. The German spearheads were finally halted on December 26, high watermark day, and the Nazi forces suffered <clears throat> and fell back. The Americans launched a decisive counterattack, and Ike said that the Allies were on the road to victory. He halted the Americans and let the Russian forces take Berlin. <clears throat> Excuse me. Letters from Ike, <clears throat> Versailles. I've been advanced in rank with title of General of the Army, five-star general. From your newspapers, you will understand we have been under some stress. War is truly a brutal business. It's hard to just sit and pray. I know that. But we must hang on to the faith and hope, and we must believe in the ultimate purposes of a merciful God. Regardless of setbacks, disappointments, and everything else, we are on the road to victory. What a boon peace will be in this poor old war. The doctor dropped by the other day to give me a checking up. Except for a stinging lecture he gave me on the number of cigarettes I smoke, he seemed pleased with my condition. The final weeks, February 15th to May 7th, 1945. Events on the front. The final assault on Germany came in February. Ike stopped Allied troops at the Elba and Mulda rivers thus allowing the Soviets to take Berlin single-handedly. The Germans wanted a separate peace with the Western Allies, but Ike issued an ultimatum. We will close the front within 48 hours if Germany does not surrender to the Allies. Finally, on May 7th, Germany fell. Ike's hatred of the Nazis was inflamed by their useless prolonging of the war. He refused to negotiate or even to participate in the surrender ceremony. Letter, Ike's letters from Reims. We've got another battle in progress. 
Prospects look good, but I never count my Germans until they're in the cage or are buried. Our troops are solidly across the Rhine. The other day, I visited a German internment camp. I never dreamed that such cruelty, bestiality, and savagery could really exist in this world. It was horrible. These are trying times. The enemy's armed forces are disintegrating, but in the tangled skein of European politics, nothing can be done except with utmost care and caution where the interests of more than one country are involved. Celebrations of Victory, May 8th through July 11th, 1945. Events on the front. What most complicated Ike's job was that nearly all major decisions and all the ones with political overtones had to be made by himself. He had to process military prisoners, care for civilian displaced persons, and make preparations for the winter. The U.S. Army was now busily um, preparing for the deployment of many of its divisions and air units from Europe to the Far East. In London, Ike found himself mobbed on the streets. For the remaining 24 years, he would never again walk a street as a private citizen. He came back to the United States in June, and we were able to take two weeks off at the Greenbrier, White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. He fished, played golf, and relaxed. We flew from Washington to West Point, my first airplane ride ever. And um, just an aside, our son John was um, going to West Point, and his graduation from West Point was on D-Day. So Ike was not able to come back to Washington to see his son graduate from West Point because he was a little busy that day. Yeah. <laughs> Letters from Ike, Reams. I must attend se several formal receptions. The troops here would feel their long fighting record underappreciated if their senior commanders were not received with some acclaim on their first trip home. The country of Germany is devastated. Whole cities are obliter obliterated, and the German population is largely homeless. Our headaches are many, persistent and acute. We knew the immediate post-surrender period would be difficult, but in my wildest nightmares, I never visualized some of the things now thrown at me. Anyway, the killing is over in this theater. I hope another American shell never has to be fired in Europe. To the aid of the former enemy, July 12th through November 10th, 1945. Ike was soon recalled to take over as Chief of Staff of the Army, as General Marshall wished to retire. His greatest concern now was that the Germans whom he had recently been fighting, could survive the winter of 1945 to 46. President Truman had received word that the Jewish displaced persons camps were in a deplorable condition and directed Ike to make a personal inspection. He then departed for the United States, but developed pneumonia and was admitted to the hospital. He never returned to his position as Commander-in-Chief, European Theater. His letter. The problem of running Germany gets no easier. There is much to do, but we plug away and are making progress. The immediate concern is conditions here this winter. Every indication points to a ration basis little above starvation level for the population with acute shortages in food, fuel, and shelter. I'll tell, I tell all the same thing. After this war, I just want to be a one mule farmer in Virginia or Georgia or Tennessee. After the war. 
Truman appointed Ike Chief of Staff of the Army, replacing General George Marshall. Ike was not eager for the task of demobilizing the great wartime army. In early 1948, Ike was able to leave active duty to assume the presidency of Columbia University. With the Korean War looming, Truman asked Ike to be commander of the military forces of NATO. He held that position for one and a half years. He was president of the United States from 1953 to 1961. In January 1961, we returned to the farm we had bought outside of Gettysburg. Ike died on March 28, 1969. We were married and in love for 50 years. Thank you. Wow. Um, the letters um, to Mamie, the excerpts from some of the letters to Mamie that Dwight wrote um, to her are in a book that was um, put together by their son, um, John, and he went through all for um, seven er, years and years in the 1970s, years later, as Mamie, I found a box of all the letters that Ike had written me, 319, in a box, and I gave them to my son John and said, you need to do something with these. <laughs> and so it took him a couple years, but he went through all of them and um, wrote the book, and, and then they are, and the whole collection is at the, um, the Eisenhower Library in Abilene, so you can read the, the originals if you wow. want there. Yeah. Thank you. Questions or, um, I think this is really going to tie in nicely with your display, don't you? Don't you, Lou? Isn't this going to be good for your, for your Eisenhower display? Yeah. Thank you. Yes? There's supposed to be a memorial for Eisenhower on the mall in Washington. Have any plans been made to finalize that? Hmm. I don't, does anybody know about that? I remember uh, Senator Dole and uh, some other senator were on TV talking about the plan, but you don't know anything about that. I don't, no, I don't. I'm sorry. Yes. What most impressed you from reading through all the letters and everything okay. about the relationship between Ike and Mamie? Okay, well, uh, outside of their relationship, what impressed me the most, I really didn't know much about Ike as a person, just as a, a military figure and a president. And his devotion to duty, his morals, his ethics, he was such a high-minded person. I mean, I, I can tear up a little bit because I just have so much respect for him from, list, from reading these letters and how duty always came first. And he told Mamie that before they ever got married, he said, you will never be first in my life. You will always be second. My duty to my country will always be first, and you will be second. And she knew that going in. And I, I think it really comes through in his letters that he loved her, he missed her, he wanted to come home, but it was, he was so focused on doing his duty for his country, such a patriot. And that's what I got out of, um, out of reading these letters. Now, as far as their relationship, you know, all the rumors, rumor, he, rumors of him, rumors of her, um, from reading these letters, I discount all of those rumors. He was totally devoted to her and told her, and when they did get together, they had their conflicts. Like they, they, you know, she kept saying, we've changed, we're, we're not the same, you know, you're, of course, you know, they're not the same, what he had gone through. And so they had their little, you know, differences. Plus the newspapers had all these rumors. She would read the newspapers about what was going on over there. She would write to him and say, what's going on over there? He would reassure her. And um, the other, another thing about their relationship, I, I don't mean to 
um, to go on and on. But another thing is um, she, the newspapers were, there were rumors that she had a drinking problem, um, you know, back in Washington. And um, at one point she did, um, she was drinking a little bit too much. And one of her friends set, took her aside and said, you know, I know you're lonely. I know you're depressed. I know there's all these rumors going around, but you you really need to get this under control. And so, and she immediately said, "Thank you for telling me." And that was it. She stopped drinking, and um, you know. But here's something else that I, that they found out later, is that um, all of that time she was not in good health ever. She was always in ill health. Um, but nobody really knew what it was. She just was never felt good. Um, what happened later in her life is she got um, she got diagnosed with Munir, Munir's disease, which is kind of a vertigo thing. And so when she was she was losing her balance, and so she had to hang on to the stairs when she was walking. She would you know frequently be wobbly and you know disoriented and people were saying she's drunk she's you know she's she's had too much to drink well it wasn't that it was this balance um, problem that she had and um, so you know so I mean there's always more to the story than you know than what meets the newspaper eye you know yes I mean, just so people know at the top of the stairs is a photograph of Amy and I but he dedicated this building in, right. in, in, the, in the 1950s. Yes, they came, they came another, another one of my yes. presentations. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I, Mamie is from Denver, and uh, they frequently came to Denver, and that's how he got to be friends with Axel Nielsen. And um, so the um, city founders, um, some investors got together and went to the city council and said, we will dedicate this piece of land for a library, but you have to name it the Mamie Dowd Eisenhower Library. And so they accepted the land. And um, Ike and Mamie came in 1963, dedicated this building. And it was actually down here on this garden level. It was, the in, this room. It was in this room. This was where all the books were. And Mamie and Ike, you know, dedicated it, came down here, they, the governor of Colorado. And, and then um, later, of course, the library was moved a couple times to where it is now. But it still remains the Mamie Dowd Eisenhower Library because um, Axel and Bal Swan and all those guys said, we'll give you the land, but you have to name it after her. So she's, it's the only library in the country that's named after a first lady. So. It's kind of cool. But it used to be right here. I mean, she was probably, he was probably standing right here. <laughs> if you want to come and stand in the footsteps of Ike, here it is. <laughs> so, thank you, Mike. Well, we just wanted to thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Oh, you didn't have to do that. Thank you. Well, we normally, we normally always give a challenge coin, but right now, <laughs> She, uh, Colleen doesn't need four. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank, so anyway, you, Mike. thank you, Mike. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. Well, I hope you'll stay around, visit some more here, see the exhibit upstairs, help us with all the food in the back, visit our library. Although yes. I think we're assembling a big case in there. But well, please stay the around. The library has more books in there now than what they had here. Yeah. Yes, yeah. you're right. Yeah. You're right. And the other thing it only is, started with 900 books when this library opened. So <laughs> We have a nice collection of books who need a new home. They're in the, right in the hallway here. So please take a look. If you see of anything of interest, or even if you think